Um, so just to introduce our speakers today, um, so I'm not speaking, but my name is Fiona McLeod. I am a senior associate um, and I sit within our social housing team in Brodies. Um, I'm joined this morning um, by Bob um, Langridge, who is a partner in our corporate um, team. Bob is an experienced corporate tax lawyer. He regularly advises on high-end real estate taxation, corporate restructions, and the taxation of funds and asset managers, startup, high-growth companies, and business owners. He acts for a wide range of clients, from some of Scotland's largest real estate developers and investors to other firms of accountants and lawyers in need of specialist advice. Bob's recognised as being a specialist in property taxation and LBTT, and he's a member of the Law Society's Tax Law Subcommittee and Stamp Taxes Practitioners Group. He's also a member of the VAT Practitioners Group and is on the committee of the Edinburgh branch of the CIOT. So with no further ado, Bob, I will pass over to you and let you kick off. Thanks very much. Thank you, Fiona, uh, for the introduction. So the agenda today, it's four and a half ways of developing affordable housing. Um, so what we're going to look at are essentially four different structures that are used in housing developments uh, and are common in the affordable housing space and then a slight variation on them at the end which is the half. Um, what we're going to be looking at here really are transactional taxes so VAT and LBTT uh, which for LBTT you can read along across to its sister taxes, SDLT and LTT. Um, but we're not going to be looking at things like corporation tax here because that's largely the same in each of these structures. In each structure, we're also going to be assuming uh, that, the, um, that the developer in our structure has to go and acquire the land from a landowner so that it doesn't actually own the land itself the time the, the round of transactions are being planned. And what we'll see here is that a lot of what drives these structuring options and choices that parties make are is the initial VAT treatment of the land uh, that is being uh, posited by the land owner. So not necessarily a party that the RSL or the funder is going to be engaging with. The other thing I would say just before we get into these structures is that they are all slightly simplified versions of the structures we will see in actual live transactions. Uh, this is just because every transaction is different. Uh, and also all of them are gonna slightly be biased and they'll represent my preferred approach to planning these things, which is taking a holistic view of both the funder and the developer's tax treatment and trying to balance those out in a way that you know, if there is a tax charge landing on one party, it can be priced in appropriately. So first of all, first way of developing social housing that we're going to look at, this is very much our base case and it's kind of the one against which the others will be compared. And these are turnkey developments. So turnkey development is simply a development where the developer acquires the land from a landowner. It builds out the development to completion and then it transfers the completed property to the buyer, in this case, going to be an RSL. This is in some ways the simplest of the, the structures you can look at, but it is probably the least tax efficient as well in terms of your transaction taxes. In this structure, the developer is going to pay land and buildings transaction tax, usually at the commercial rates on the site acquisition cost. So, Easiest way to think about this is a flat charge of about 5% and may or may not pay that at 20% on the cost of the land as well. A big thing for developers in dealing with a turnkey project is that they're going to be funding the development cost up front. And they're also going to be directly financing any kind of professional fees as well. In terms of the VAT treatment of all of this, they are going to be paying that at 20% on any professional fees, so land agents, architects, surveyors, etc. Because of the way VAT on construction costs work, they are likely to pay 0% on the actual construction costs they pay to their downstream contractors, but they will 
bear an irrecoverable VAT charge of 20% on the white goods. So these are things like cookers, uh, curtains, carpeting that go into the houses. When the developer sells the completed project onto the, the funder, they will be able to charge that at 0% on the sale of those completed dwellings. This is great for the funder because it means they're not carrying any development risk and they are paying VAT at 0% on the site acquisition costs. And depending on the nature of the funder, because we see a few different kinds of entities acting in this space, they may or may not pay LVTT on the cost of the site. If they're a registered social landlord or a charity, they may qualify for RSL relief, which is quite restrictive, or charities relief from LVTT. And if not, they will be able to claim multiple dwellings relief. Uh, they'll also be VAT on any professional fees that they have to bear. Moving on to the next slide, just to give you a feel for how these options differ, I'm going to give you some headline tax figures. And in all cases, we're going to make the following assumptions that the land, the actual development site, costs 2 million. The building costs are 10 million. And to get above the foundations, this is going to be about 2 million pounds of build costs. We're going to assume 375,000 on the white goods in the properties. We're going to assume that the developer will make a total profit of about three million pounds, and they are going to be developing uh, a project of 75 homes. So in this case, the developer is going to initially pay 400,000 pounds of VAT on the land. They'll be able to recover that VAT, but it will feed into the amount of LVTT they'll pay. They'll bear £75,000 of VAT on the white goods that is irrecoverable VAT for them. And they'll also pay about £108,000 of LVTT on the bare side. So on the developer's side of our balance sheet, if you like, we have absolute transaction costs of £183,500 plus um, a £400,000 VAT bill that they will need to cash flow, but they will be able to recover. On the funder side of this, if the funder is able to claim uh, charities or RSL relief, then there should be no transaction cost leakage for them. If they are unable to claim either of those reliefs, then they will be looking at if they claim multiple dwellings relief against £10 million and 75 dwellings, uh, approximately £184,625 of LVTT. So worst case scenario in the round on these numbers, you are looking at about £370,000 of tax leakage in terms of the transaction costs. An important concept that I want to talk about now, uh, and that is key to all of the following structures, and that I mentioned briefly before, is the ability to charge that at 0%. This is the secret ingredient of any uh, development transaction where you are dealing with dwellings. There are two aspects to zero rating that are important. Number one, if your project qualifies as dwellings for VAT purposes, and there is a specific statutory definition, then the construction costs can be zero rated. Secondly, if you meet the relevant conditions for a transfer, in other words, it is the first grant of a major interest, uh, a major interest is transfer of ownership or the grant of a lease of not less than 20 years in Scotland. In England and Wales, it has to be over 21 years of a dwelling or a number of dwellings by a person who's constructed those dwellings, then that first grant of the major interest can be zero rated as well, which means that no VAT is payable by the RSL on the acquisition of the completed dwellings from the developer. This is important because there's a difference between making a zero rated supply for VAT and an exempt supply. An exempt supply, you do not charge VAT at all. And the downside of making an exempt supply is that you cannot recover any of the VAT incurred on your supply cost. So, for example, letting, 
residential property is exempt from VAT. So VAT on your supply costs for getting that residential property and on your ongoing operational costs is irrecoverable. A zero rated supply, you are charging that, you are just charging it at the rate of 0%. This means that your buyer doesn't have to bear an additional cost in the form of VAT, but it means that you as the party making the zero rated supply are entitled to recover the VAT you've incurred. So this is essential in dwellings developments because it allows the developer or the party acting as developer in the structure to recover the VAT they incur, but without creating an irrecoverable VAT charge for the registered social landlord or whichever other party is going to be letting those dwellings out. So the pros and cons of a, a turnkey development, it's incredibly simple. You build a building, you sell it. It doesn't require much planning and it carries very low risk. On the other hand, it is the least tax efficient of all the different structures. Um, and it does raise the question, can the developer cash flow the project? Will they have to go and take out external financing? Do they have the equity to do it? So this leads us on to a very common structure, which is way number two, and this is the forward funded transaction. Now, this one looks a little bit more complicated on the slide. But what in, sense, what in effect is happening is the developer buys land from the landowner and immediately sells it on to the funder. They don't ever take title to it, as it were. They buy it and they sell it on the same day. So the registered social landlord or whoever's funding takes title on day one. And then a development funding agreement or a development agreement is put in place between the developer and the RSL, under which the developer builds out the property for the, the, the funder. This is a bit more tax efficient in a number of ways. First of all, the developer is likely going to qualify for something called subsale development relief from LBTT on this transaction. This means that they will pay zero LBTT on the acquisition and sale of the land to the funder. It also means for the developer that the development, fund, or the development costs are funded because they will draw down cash sums from the funder under the development agreement as they arise. This is often done on a monthly basis. They'll still pay back at 20% on their professional fees and they will pay that at 0% on the construction costs. The issue for a developer here is that if the landowner has opted to tax the site, in other words, if the landlord, if the landowner has elected to charge VAT, the developer has a difficult decision to make if they are going to pursue a basic forward fund. And that is, do they charge that VAT onto the RSL or not? If they do, it is going to become a sticking cost of the RSL under this basic structure. If they don't, it's likely going to become a sticking cost of the developer because they are now making an exempt supply of land to the RSL, which means that they are unlikely to be able to recover their VAT on the purchase costs. For an RSL, this can be quite tax efficient as well. If they don't qualify for charities relief, they'll only pay LBTT on the land price without the development costs being added to it as they would under a, uh, under a turnkey project. They might still be able to claim RSL or charities relief, but if they can't, they won't be qualifying for multiple dwellings relief as there are no dwellings in under construction on the site. Again, there's a difficult decision for a registered social landlord if the landowner has opted to tax the original site and the developer wants to do the same. The RSL does potentially have the ability to disapply an option to tax put in place by the developer and treat the sale as exempt. In practice, we don't often see this card being played because it simply wouldn't be commercially viable for the parties, and we'll come on to that in a second. The other difference for the RSL is now it is going to bear irrecoverable VAT 
of 20% on the white goods, so the competing, etc., as well as VAT on its own professional fees. So just drilling into that VAT tension I meant, mentioned and the difficult decision. If the developer has paid VAT on the land because the landlord has, I mean, the landowner has elected to charge it, then really they're going to need to charge VAT on the onward sale of that land in order to recover it. That means opting to tax the land. A registered social landlord can disapply that option by issuing a certificate in uh, an approved form. Uh, the approved form can be found in revenue guidance. But they can only do this really before the price has been legally fixed, which in HMRC parlance means that signed heads of terms have been agreed. If they do issue the certificate before the price is legally fixed, they can do it unilaterally. If they do it after the price has been legally fixed, then they can only do it with the agreement of the developer. Otherwise, it has no effect. The reason for this point in time price being legally fixed is simple. Um, if you want to disapply an option to tax, um, you need to allow the developer the ability to adjust their pricing to accommodate. If the RSL cannot disapply an option to tax and has to pay VAT on the land price, then they're not going to be able to recover that VAT because the RSL, as we discussed before, is going to be making exempt supplies of letting residential property. So you then have to think about a number of things which will come on to. First of all, can the RSL itself make a zero weighted supply? Well, potentially, yes. And we're going to look at two structures that do that. Or if the RSL doesn't want to or cannot explore one of these two structures, you could agree, for example, to split the VAT costs 50-50. Um, I don't want to go into the maths of this, but when the VAT rate is 20%, you can do this by tipping the price by an 11, not 11%, but one over 11. That means ultimately that the developer, by bearing the price chip, is going to bear equivalent cost to the VAT that the fund will bear on the reduced price. And in each case, it's equal to half of what the VAT would have been. We've only really employed that approach, I'd say twice in the past, where all other avenues have been closed. The other thing that's relevant in these forward funding structures and in the structures that follow is something called prudential planning. This is something it's always worth thinking about on any forward funding structures, but it's equally important here. Prudential planning uh, involves an old 1995 stamp duty case, Prudential versus the Inland Revenue Commissioners, which is accepted to apply for LBTP. The kernel of the Prudential decision is that you have to look at legally, and it's an odd decision because it's a structure over, a, a structure over uh, content decision, legally you have to look at what your end buyer is transacting to buy. Are they transacting to buy completed buildings, albeit that the developer is going to build them after the fact of the land sale, or are they entering into two separate and distinct transactions, one a purchase of land and two uh, the engage of a developer to build on that land. And Prudential says that if it's the latter, then the build costs are outside of the scope of LBTT. And if it's the former, then it's everything that is within the scope of LBTT. And it's generally accepted by Revenue Scotland and HMRC now that if the build contract and the buy contract are sufficiently independent, so in other words, they're not cross-conditional, Although it's accepted you can have a build con a development contract, which is conditional on your purchase contract, because it makes no sense to uh, contract to have someone build on land you don't own. Um, but beyond that, provided there's no cross conditionality and there are no cross remedies for breach of contracts. So, for example, if the development isn't satisfactory, the funder cannot force the developer to buy back the land under the sale contract. 
then the build cost can be excluded to the extent it's just and reasonable to do so from the charge to LBTT. Another important factor in these kind of arrangements is the developer's ability to claim a subsale or development relief. This is where a relief is available where you've got a chain of parties to a transaction. Here I'm just calling them A, B, and C. A is the land owner, B is the developer, C is the ultimate purchaser. And it's available where A, B, and C enter into successive sale and purchase contracts, and they have to be entered into the right order. So A and B enter into their contract before B and C do. A has to own the land at the time they contract with the developer, and all the sales, the sale from A to B and the sale from B to C, have to complete or be substantially performed on the same day. If those conditions are met and there is the prospect of substantial development works being completed within five years of the transactions happening, then B, our developer, can claim a full relief from LBTT. Um, a couple of warning points here. It's much more restrictive in LBTT than it is in SDLT. The LBTT relief doesn't apply to assignations of contracts. And it can also be very problematic if you are trying to structure both contracts using options. You have to take a great deal of care in the timing of exercising those options if you're going to use them. Anyway, moving on to the, the numbers, you can see immediately that this is much more tax efficient, provided that you can deal with VAT on the land. If the landowner hasn't opted to tax the land, then usually the developer's sticking costs will be limited to £75,000 on the white goods. The reason I put these against the developer is normally under the development agreement. It is market practice to say that the developer will bear that cost, but that can be negotiated so that it lies with the funder if necessary. But the developer doesn't pay any LBTT on the site. So their costs are really limited to 75,000 here. On the RSL side, leaving aside that on the land, the only likely transaction tax cost that they will bear is LBTT on the bear site itself. Here it's 108,500, but that could be nil if RSL or charities relief are available. So you can see here that the transaction tax costs are about halved or even better than half by using a forward fund structure. But it only works if you can deal with VAT on the land. So again, it's a relatively simple structure to use. That's a big pro and it's on, it's quite a well-trodden path. It doesn't require an enormous amount of planning to rely on it and it's much more tax efficient. Downsides of using a forward fund, you still need to work out what to do about VAT on the land if it's going to be payable. You sometimes have a bit of a negotiation about making sure the subsale planning works. And one thing about subsale relief is the development has to be carried out within five years or the relief is called back. So often you might have a bit of a negotiation as well about getting in place an appropriate indemnity for the developer. Um, how wide and restrictive you want that indemnity to be uh, to cover the developer against the risk of losing the relief. You also just have slightly higher transaction risk in terms of things like prudential planning and making sure that is negotiated and documented appropriately. If the landowner is going to charge VAT on the land, then the next two transaction structures we're going to look at involve what is called a golden brick transfer. This is one way of unlocking that problem. The first one is what I call developer to RSL. Here, the transaction is a mixture of a turnkey and a forward fund. The developer will buy the bare site from the landowner. We'll assume the landowner has charged that because if they hadn't, you probably wouldn't be doing this. Landowner charges VAT. The developer is going to buy that site and retain it for a while. 
So they're not going to be able to claim subsidy of development relief, and they are going to pay VAT on the site costs. The developer is then going to build out the site to what is called Golden Brick. Golden Brick is historically it is the first brick above the foundation level although with modern building techniques there are other ways of looking at it for example if you're using a steel frame structure it might be when the first beams in that steel frame are erected above the foundations the importance of golden brick is that once you have passed the golden brick point the that legislation and also the LBTT legislation accepts that you have dwellings in the course of construction. You don't have that when you have a bare site and you don't have that when you're doing foundational works. But once you get above that golden brick, you have dwellings in the course of construction and they can benefit from the same zero rating rules as completed dwellings. So this means that a developer, they'll pay the same 0% VAT on their construction costs, but once they hit golden brick, they will sell the partly completed site to the registered social landlord, and they'll be able to zero rate that, charge that at zero percent, and recover the VAT that they paid to acquire the site. The RSL again might be able to claim charities or RSL relief. If it cannot, it will pay LBTT on the land price, plus, in effect, the cost of getting to the golden brick point, the cost of the development works up to the date of transfer. Those together are going to be subject to LBTT. But unlike an ordinary forward fund where the bare development site is transferred here because you've got dwellings in the course of construction, the funder can benefit from multiple dwellings relief to bring the costs down. And happily, they're going to pay that at 0% on the acquisition of land, and they will pay that at 0% on the development services that they will procure from the developer after the land is transferred. Again, with the exception of white goods. And the RSL, again, may also have that on their own professional fees. So, if VAT is being charged on the land, you can see that this, again, is much more tax efficient than a forward fund. Here on our uh, pricing assumptions, the developer is going to bear £400,000 of VAT on the land, which is going to be recoverable. We're going to assume that the development agreement sticks them with the white good cost, so they have £75,000 of irrecoverable VAT. There'll be LBTT on the bare site of £108,000. So the developer's costs are much the same as they were under a turnkey project, but they do get the benefit of having the post golden brick development works funded by the funder and not having to meet those costs up front. The RSL, on the other hand, is going to pay zero VAT on the land if they've negotiated their development agreement in line with market practice, zero VAT on the white goods. And here we're estimating, if you take into account two million pounds of land price and two million pounds of development works up to Golden Brick and multiple dwellings relief, 47,125 pounds of LBTT, which is considerably lower than they would have paid under a, a turnkey project. So, this is, again, a reasonably simple route for development. It requires a little bit of tax planning. It is not as tax efficient as a pure forward fund, but it does let you deal with that VAT problem on the land. On the downside, you do still have questions about can the developer fund those golden brick works? And you may have some commercial discussions about risk allocation, because there is going to be a bit of transactional risk around things like identifying when you will hit golden brick. 
and agreeing when you hit golden brick is something that the developer and the funder, or more likely their advisors, are going to have to do. That brings us on to way four, which is another golden brick transfer. But unlike the one we just looked at, all of the transfers are going to take place, or the golden brick transfer is going to take place on the registered social landlords side. So this is the most complicated diagram we've got to look at. Here again, we're assuming that the landowner is charging that on the site because that's what makes this a sensible option to explore. The developer is going to buy the site and immediately sell it on to the RSL, but they're not going to sell it on to the RSL or the funder directly. Instead, the funder will create one or two subsidiary entities. Here I've gone for companies and I've just called them RSL1, RSL2. The developer is going to subsell the land the same day it buys it onto RSL1. For the developer, this is pretty great. It means that they don't pay LBTT on the land price because they're not going to qualify for subsale relief. They will pay that at 20% on the site acquisition costs, but they are going to charge that at 20% to RSL number one. The developer's costs are now fully funded and they're going to be able to fully recover the VAT they incur. When they sell the site onto RSL number one, they're also going to enter into a development funding agreement with RSL number one. So if we leave out RSL at the top and RSL number two here, so far we just have a normal forward funding transaction. RSL one, this entity here, will pay LBTT on the price of the land. They're not going to qualify for RSL relief, and they're not going to qualify for charities relief because they are not the RSL or the charity, they're a subsidiary entity. And they're not going to get multiple dwellings relief either. And they're going to pay that at 20% on the acquisition cost of the land. So far, this looks pretty tax inefficient. However, they are going to pay that at 0% on build costs, and they are going to pay that they're going to charge that at zero percent when the site hits golden brick when the site hits golden brick they can transfer ownership of the site to a second entity now that could be the rsl itself or it could be here i've gone with rsl number two as a second subsidiary company this transfer it should usually be possible and this structure under the RSL varies from deal to deal, but it should usually be possible, and it's one of the keys to doing this kind of transaction, to complete this transfer without an LBTT charge. There are different routes to getting there. One of them, as you would do in this example, is to claim LBTT group relief, but that's not the only way. If you can't, RSL2, because it's now buying dwellings in the course of construction, can consider a multiple dwellings relief claim, which should reduce the tax payable. Because we're doing a transfer between RSL1 and RSL2 at Golden Brick, the VAT on that transfer is 0%. So there's no sticking VAT charge in RSL number two. And it allows RSL number one, crucially, to recover the VAT it paid on the acquisition of the land. RSL number two is going to continue paying that at 0% on the development costs because when the land is sold between the two RSL entities, that development funding agreement is going to be novated across as well. RSL number two and RSL number one still potentially have that on their professional fees. But when you get into the numbers, this is a relatively tax efficient way of doing things. It's much more tax efficient, in fact, I would argue, than uh, the previous structure, the uh, developer doing the golden brick transfer. 
Here, there's two lots of VAT at £400,000, but both parties are now entitled to recover this. The developer will bear VAT on white goods uh, under the development agreement, but they won't pay any LVTT on the site, so their costs are limited to that £75,000. And RSL entity number one is going to pay VAT of uh, £400,000 recoverable, no VAT on development costs, and LVTT on the bare site of 108500 So again, this is a very tax efficient way of structuring these. It has minimal transaction tax leakage compared to, say, doing uh, a turnkey or a forward fund. Uh, where you're not dealing with the VAT issues on the land. Although it looks like some of the costs here for fall on the RSL rather than on the developers, they do on other structures because the developers claiming subsidy relief and the RSL number one could not. My advice there is simply that if you are planning these things carefully in advance and taking the appropriate advice, you should be able to factor in that change liability and the incidence of liability falling on the RSL side when you're actually pricing out the deal itself. So pros of this, it's very tax efficient. There's no sticking back whatsoever except for white goods. It helps unlock the VAT issue that you get on a very basic forward fund. And for the developer, it means that they don't have to fund any golden brick costs whatsoever. It's one of the more complex structures you can use. Um, key to making it work is really some careful planning needed between the RSL entities to ensure that LVTT is kept to a minimum on that golden brick transfer. Because in reality, the RSL is trading off vast efficiency here in exchange for taking a hit on the LBTT, unless that is priced in. This brings me on to way four and a half. This is the half, and this is something I've called using an RSL dev code. The reason this is half is because you can adapt any of the non-turnkey structures to incorporate this. This is it used in a normal forward fund structure. And you can see it's a bit more complicated than an ordinary forward fund. If we look at the top part of the diagram, the transaction is kind of complete as normal. A landowner sells the site to a developer who subsells it on to the registered social landlord or the funder. And the tax consequences for the developer are entirely the same. No LBTT. Uh, here we're assuming there's no VAT on the land because otherwise you'd be using something more complex. They've got their development costs paid under the development funding agreement. But what's different is that they are not entering into the development funding agreement with the registered social landlord. Instead, the RSL will set up a, another entity, usually a subsidiary or something that sits elsewhere in its group, and that is the RSL dev code. The purpose of this is to procure development services for the RSL and professional services for the RSL and to deliver to the RSL the housing. So the development funding agreement is put in place between the developer and RSL DevCo. So we're effectively taking two elements of a classic forward fund and splitting them in half. The RSL entity here will pay LBTT on the bare land price unless it can claim charities or RSL relief, but it can't claim multiple dwellings relief. It'll pay no VAT on the acquisition of the land. Um, and it will pay that at 0% on development costs except for white goods. RSL DevCo is going to be procuring development services from the developer, making an onward supply of them to the RSL. And it's also going to be procuring any of the other professional services that the RSL requires. Now, these could be legal fees. They could also be agents fees. 
or in cases where the project is design led by the RSL, could incorporate architects' fees and surveyors' fees as well. These costs all get paid by the RSL DevCo, and it has its own development funding agreement or its own development services agreement with the RSL, under which it recharges those costs. For VAT purposes, the developer should be charging 0% VAT to the DEVCO. The professional team, such as they are, I've gone forward a slide, will be charging VAT at 20%. But DEVCO, if the drafting is correct, should just be charging VAT at 0% onto the RSL. And what this allows you to do is, particularly where you've got a very RSL design led project, it allows the RSL to recover the VAT on their professional fees that otherwise is likely to have been a sticking cost. So it has all the benefits of a normal board funding transaction or whatever other transaction structure you're using, but with the added benefit of allowing a little bit of extra VAT recovery on the RSL side. So pros of this, a bit of extra RSL VAT recovery, and you can really adapt any of the other structures to fit in with this methodology. It's a bit more complex to use than any of the other structures because you're going to be drafting multiple development agreements, which are going to do slightly different things. You're going to have one agreement with RSL DevCo and the developer, and a second one between RSL DevCo and the RSL itself. And also, it has a downside in the RSL. DEVCO, if you are using it to procure land, like you would do in uh, structure four, the RSL side, golden brick, um, it won't qualify for any charities or RSL reliefs. So those are four and a half different structures for developing affordable housing, looking at the transaction taxes, You'll notice that I haven't gone into detail here about things like RSL relief or charities relief, because really what drives these structures is not so much the availability of those reliefs, but it's much more driven by things like DAT. And a lot of that DAT pressure will often come from the original landowner who isn't party to the negotiations between the RSL and the developer. So I'm going to. So I mean, someone has asked the question, could I just summarize uh, what RSL and Charities Relief look like? Charities Relief is available if you have a entity which is a registered charity, which is buying land for a recognized charitable purpose. RSL Relief is a bit more tricky, and there are two legs to it. First of all, to get RSL Relief from LBTT, your entity needs to be a registered social landlord. So not every entity dealing with affordable housing will meet that test. If you do have an RSL, it has to meet one of three follow-on conditions. It either needs to be controlled by its tenants through things such as the board, that's optional condition number one, or you have optional condition number two, and that is that the seller of the land is a registered social land board, the Scottish ministers, or a local authority. So if you are buying from the developer, for example, that condition won't be available. Or you can meet option C, which is that the development and the acquisition of the land is funded by a grant, and that will be a grant either under the National Lotteries Act or the or Section 2 of the Housing Scotland Act 1988. So it has to be an RSL and then has to meet one of those three conditions on them. So that is us now to time. Um, any other questions that come through, we will answer by email, but thank you very much for attending. I hope you found this useful and I hope you'll be coming back to the next webinar on 25th of October. Thank you.